Hey team, Dr. Jack Gordy here, and in this video, I'm going to cover the invention of vaccines. In the previous video, I introduced the adaptive immune response. Now, two key components of the adaptive immune response is the proliferation of a B cell that can produce an antibody that can bind to an antigen that's on that pathogen. These antibodies glue the pathogens together, and this is quite a specific response, um, and that by gluing the pathogen together, together you prevent it from being a disease you package it up it can't spread throughout your body it can be eaten by phagocytes for example now because each b cell has a unique antibody and because we have a very low number of b cells that can recognize any one disease um diseases can often proliferate and um get throughout our body become a very successful infection before we can get enough b cells to produce enough antibody to take down that pathogen so the principle of vaccines is the idea that we expose our immune system to part of the disease or a similar disease or a disabled disease to cause that proliferation of the cell so that when we do get exposed to the disease, we actually have a large number of those B cells ready to pump out the antibody that can fight that pathogen and recognize the antigens on that pathogen now i've said b cell but the same is also true for t cells we have t cells that coordinate the immune response called t helper cells and they have specific t help uh, t cell receptors that are unique to each t cell um, that can uh that can recognize antigens from the pathogens much in the way antibodies work and we also have cytotoxic t-cells so by giving by exposing our body to the antigen before we even get the disease we go from a very low number of b-cells and t-cells and cytotoxic t-cells that can recognize those pathogens to a high number of those cells so when we do get infected with it we've already got loads of those cells ready to immediately respond to the disease so how do we come across Across these principles and what was the invention of vaccines well it's a, a many attribute it to this guy here called Edward Jenner who did some very famous experiments at the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century but it doesn't actually start there but let me start by telling you about the disease the first disease that we ever vaccinated against very effectively it's called smallpox here it is here it's a horrific disease as we can see in fact I, th I, I would guess the game of thrones dragon scale is based on the smallpox disease because you can see it's very horrific and it affects the skin there's two strains variola major and variola minor and the major strain causes 30 percent fatality and the minor um, version causes about one percent fatality 30 percent fatality is a huge fatality rate for a virus that is terrifying so um, it's a DNA virus with a membrane envelope and it replicates in the cytoplasm. This is all very similar to SARS-CoV-2, except for SARS-CoV-2, it's an RNA virus. But they're very similar, membrane bound, and they replicate in the cytoplasm. Now, everyone always talks about Edward Jenner, but actually that's a very Western-centric view. There were versions of vaccination all throughout the globe prior to Edward Jenner, right? And one example is in China in the 16th century, this thing called variolation. Now, if I step back one slide, we can see variola is the uh, genus name of the, oh, sorry, it's the species name of smallpox. So this is where this comes from. So variolation is a smallpox method. And basically, you take scabs from an infected patient who was infected with variola minor so it caused minor symptoms and it didn't cause fatality so you take those scabs those dry scabs you grind them up into a dust and you insert them up the nose so this gentleman is blowing them up the nose of this person here and they breathe it in essentially infecting themselves with variola minor now variola minor remember has a one percent fatality rate but it allows but the similarity means that we could build an adaptive of immune memory through B cells and T cells, prol the proliferation of B cells and T cells, we can build an adaptive immune memory of the smallpox disease and then not get the variola major strain. We There was already observations that um, you could not be infected twice with smallpox and so 
uh, by infecting yourself with a milder strain, you provide you you give yourself resistance to the more deadly strain, which was brilliant. It's a little bit like in today's world, the Delta variant of SARS-CoV-2 seemed to have a lower fatality rate than the Alpha variant, which was the first variant that came out of China. So. Um, Perhaps, like a, the equivalent strategy, if we didn't have modern medicine and vaccine, the equivalent strategy would be seeking out someone with the Delta variant um, and infecting yourself with that to reduce your chances of getting the more severe variants um, of the Alpha variant, for example. We don't need to do that because we've got vaccines. The Delta variant still seems to have a fatality rate of about 0.25%, which is scary. It's, that's still a scary uh, uh, fatality rate. But it's risky, right? Variolation is risky. You've still got that 1% fatality rate from variolation. And then it does another player in the game here. So cowpox is a very similar disease to smallpox. It infects the udder of it. And here we can see that an individual here. This is actually a modern example, uh, an individual here with cowpox. You can see cowpox is a milder disease than smallpox, right? Look at that. Um, it's, it's, it's a much, much milder disease, cowpox. Now, it was commonly known that milkmaids in Europe do not get smallpox, right? It was common knowledge that milk, milkmaids do not get smallpox. Here's a Baroque painting by Vermeer of a milkmaid. And basically, they milk cows all day. And so they often got cowpox. And perhaps it was the cowpox that was preventing them from getting smallpox. Now, Edward Jenner had likely heard of the Chinese method of variolation. And he knew that, you know, um, it, it came with risks, 1% death rate of getting variola minor. But not many people at all die of cowpox. It's a very, very, very minor disease. And this is where Edward Jenner entered the chat. He decided, hang on, I've got an idea here. So what he, his idea was to infect an eight-year-old boy with cowpox. This eight-year-old boy was... Um, the, the son of someone who worked for him, I think it was his gardener, and so he decided to infect this eight-year-old boy with cowpox, which, you know, cowpox is a minor disease, that seems like a reasonably bad ethical situation going on there by today's standards, but it gets a lot worse. He then, the boy underwent a temperature, underwent an immune response, and then a week or so later, Edward Jenner intentionally injected the boy with smallpox to see if the boy would get smallpox. At this point, you're crossing the line. I mean, you had already crossed the line, but that is stepping it up a level in terms of ethics. But the boy did not get smallpox. Edward Jenner then tried again to give him smallpox, and he didn't. Now, I just want to give a quick point. Like, this is just my theory, right? But if you look throughout all of history and microbiology, scientists are doing experiments on children all the time. And the idea of doing an experiment on a child today seems unfathomable. But I think what you have to remember is that they used to have 12 children, and of which only six would survive. That's an extreme example, but child fatality was very common back in those days. And so perhaps... It, I don't know, perhaps culturally it was more acceptable because children were dying all the time, and now because it's absolutely abhorrent the idea of a child dying, it seems even more ethically, like it's never ethically good, but I, I'm just wondering, like, why was why did scientists seem like absolute monsters back in the day, always doing these experiments on children, and it's perhaps because their life had less value back in that day, because children were more commonly dying, anyway, that's just me thinking, total side note, um, anyway, just trying to put it in a social context, there that maybe Edward Jenner wasn't as much as a monster because it was sort of standard practice back then I don't know seems like a monster still to me anyway anyway so that goes like this give the child cowpox the disease subsides the boy did get a fever but the disease subsides then try give him smallpox and try give him smallpox again and what he noticed was he didn't get the disease which was brilliant this essentially led to the development of the Edward Jenner vaccine. Um, and we developed it a little bit more. So what we used was we took the lymphatic fluid of calves that had been infected with cowpox or a similar disease. Another disease actually entered the chat there a little bit later. And you would freeze dry the lymphatic fluid that you could drain from a cow. Here we've got a lymph node getting cannulated, getting drained to drain that lymphatic fluid. They would freeze dry that. Then they would inject that in the to people, they would get the very minor version of the cowpox, 
Um, and the freeze drying actually helped disable the virus. So it was very minor reaction to the vaccine. And that prevented them from getting this incredibly deadly 30% fatality rate smallpox in the future. Um, and, and in fact, it actually became a government act was passed demanding compulsory vaccination in Britain. Um, in the act, it said every child whose health permits shall be vaccinated within three or in the case of all orphanages, four months of birth. So that's really young. Um, they were all vaccinated by a public vaccinator going around um, or some other medical practitioner. Basically in England and throughout America eventually as well, it became compulsory to be, to be vaccinated with the smallpox vaccine. And this actually led to a lot of pushback, a lot of the anti-vax movement. Um, and so we can see it, it echoes throughout history. Science makes one of the greatest advancements of all time that um, is absolutely brilliant, prevents you from getting something potentially fatal. And people come up, conspiracy theorists and whatnot, and um, they do fear-mongering things like this um, to say we shouldn't get vaccinated and instead we should put ourselves at risk of these diseases. But let's have a look. This is uh, deaths caused by smallpox as a share of all deaths, right? So um, before Edward Jenner, you know, 12% of all deaths were smallpox, right? So it's a huge burden, right? Of all deaths that are going on in London, 12% were smallpox. Edward Jenner around here um, releases his paper about how cowpox prevents smallpox. They develop the vaccine, it starts to roll out, and here it becomes compulsory, and then eventually it almost completely dies out in England. And in fact, it was such a successful vaccine, the World Health Organization, um, the early predecessors, but the, later on, after World War II, the World Health Organization took on this challenge to wipe out smallpox. And indeed, we did. Um, around 1980, we completely wiped out smallpox and now only exists in vials in the lab, right? So now no one is getting rid of it. So, I mean, put your hand up. Like 10% of people used to die from smallpox. Put your hand up if you know anyone who's got smallpox. You don't, do you, right? Vaccines work and are amazing, and we wiped out smallpox, which is absolutely brilliant. And all I can say is let's do it again. Let's wipe out SARS-CoV-2. Get, go get vaccinated. Um, again, it's looking like we might need boosters every six months, but let's build this pipeline so we can all get vaccinated um, often to help us avoid getting this very deadly disease that is shutting down the globe right now. So vaccines work. Edward Jenner is probably sort of the first inventor of the modern forms of vaccination. Um, even though he started with some very unethical uh, experiments, we ended up in a very great place. Um, yeah, brilliant. Okay, cool. Thanks, team.